So I am joined today by Karen Howe, Senior AI Editor of MIT Technology Review. Karen, thank you for being with us. It's great to see you again. Thank you so much for having me here, Paul. Yeah, it was when you know I reached out to you because for those who weren't with us in 2019, Karen was one of our keynotes for the first Marketing AI conference on like what is AI, and not only was it a huge impact for me, like I love the talk, but we heard so much incredible feedback from our attendees. So um, I had tried to get Karen to come on in 2020 when we were going to do the conference, and uh, you know that conference didn't end up happening. So it was okay, but then I reached back out 2021 and said, any chance we could do this again? And She's just written so many incredible articles, especially in the last year about responsible AI, AI for good, ethical AI. And it's such an important topic for us and for our audiences that that's what we wanted to kind of bring Karen back for today is to talk about that. So Karen, again, thank you so much for being back and all the contributions you make to our community. Yeah, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. So I wanted to get started with I've heard your background, but how did you end up in AI, one, two, how did you end up writing about AI instead of building AI? So let's start with how <laughs> did you get into AI? Yeah, um, well, to, to kind of explain that part, I actually have to, I have to answer the second question together. So I had a bit of an interesting journey into journalism because I actually started as an engineer. I studied mechanical engineering. Um, in undergrad at MIT. Um, and uh, at the time, the reason why I was fascinated by mechanical engineering was the idea of building, uh, I, I was very fascinated by the idea of using technology as a driver for social change. Um, and MIT has an incredible mechanical engineering program that's really focused on user-centered product design and how do you use products to change people's minds, change people's behaviors. And um, I was intrigued by that and always imagined, you know, following in the footsteps of Steve Jobs or someone like that, who really understood the user, was able to invent all these things that then completely transformed culture, transformed the way that we consume um, information, music, all of these things. Um, and when I graduated, I ended up working at a software startup first. So I kind of nudged away from the mechanical engineering hardware side of things into software. And um, I was really enamored at the time with, with the startup because it was, um, it was a startup that spun out of Google X and it was focused on building architectural software um, or urban development software that would help city governments essentially optimize their city design um, and building design to be more sustainable, be more resource efficient. And I was very interested in sustainability and climate change. Um, and about nine months into this experience where I had thought that I'd found my dream job, um, working at a very mission-driven technology company that was using technology for social change, uh, the startup devolved <laughs> because it wasn't actually making money. And the private investors got very unhappy. They um, fired the CEO, replaced him with another CEO that was supposed to be very business oriented and help us turn a profit. And he fundamentally didn't understand what we were doing, completely scrapped the product, started pivoting all over the place. And it made me think a lot about just incentives in Silicon Valley. Like if we are constantly obsessing over making quarterly returns, then we end up reducing or constraining our ability to actually pursue the, the really long time scale problems like like climate change, like poverty alleviation, all of these really um, hairy issues. And so then that's when I jumped into journalism and I started thinking about, um, you know, I've always enjoyed writing, maybe I could use writing as a tool for social change instead, um, because the journalism industry, I thought might uh, be a little bit better about being mission driven and not as pro uh, profit driven. Um, and it was through going into journalism that I then found my way into AI. So I became a general tech reporter and I was interested in tech and society and, and thinking about how do we actually hold technology accountable and make sure that we develop it um, for social change. Like I, I had experienced sort of the flaws that Silicon Valley um, had and I wanted to use a platform to try and nudge the valley in in specific direct directions to incentivize um, better products, better technology. Um, 
and from there landed in AI because AI is just so expansive and it's hard to talk about technology today without talking about AI. Um, and I, I, once I found my home there, I became very, very obsessed with it because it's the perfect microcosm of all of the tech and society issues that I wanted to talk about and um, explore. And I don't think you and I have spoken since you got appointed to the Knight Science Journalism Program Fellowship class. That's, that just happened recently, right? That just happened, yeah. So I, I proposed this project um, it's, a, it's going to be a story series on this idea that AI development today, um, if we look at it through a global lens, it's really not successfully serving everyone. Um, it, there are a lot of wealthier countries, wealthier companies that are extracting a lot of value and a lot of profit from the technology, but at the expense of vulnerable communities, vulnerable countries, um, the, the economic benefits are, are completely being distorted um, and concentrated. Um, in among countries and, and companies that already have a lot of power and money. Um, and yeah, I proposed that project. The fellowship was really excited about it. I'm super excited about it. I've been waiting for like two years at this point to write this story series. So um, yeah, I'm, 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 that's what I'm going to be focused on for the next year. Uh, congratulations. That's fantastic. I, I actually wasn't familiar with the fellowship. So anybody else, you know, watching that isn't familiar, it's, um, it's really cool. And you know, that what I saw on the site was that you were going to investigate global AI supply chain and how it concentrates, often concentrates power in the hands of the wealthy people, companies, nations, while leaving the less fortunate. So kind of you as outlined. And I think that's a really important background. So people understand the, where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So you have the intimate knowledge of the technology and how it works, what it takes to build it. And so when you're doing research and writing, you can look critically, not at just the PR messages that maybe these big tech companies want you to write about and pushing these messages out, hoping you'll sort of trumpet the things that they want out in the market. You can actually step back and look critically and say, but is this good? Like, is this the right path for the technology to go down? And that's mm -hmm. why I love your writing. And I think you, you are um optimistic about the technology like that comes through in your writing that there is there is possibility here there are things that can happen for good as you illuminated like climate change and poverty and hunger like all these things that can help do mm -hmm. but it can go very wrong also and that's kind of like what i wanted to focus on today in this conversation about responsible ai and you and i met ahead of time and kind of talked about like we have a mix of audiences. So we have people at this conference and in our community who are building AI tech. You know, maybe they work at venture funded tech companies or maybe some of them are actually working at the big AI companies. We have marketers who use AI tech and maybe don't realize the bias that can be built in or the things that can go wrong with it. And then we have business leaders who might not get into the weeds and learn all the ins and outs of AI but they're trying to figure out how to use this new technology to advance their business, to drive growth, to grow smarter. So a lot of them are really just trying to figure this stuff out and they don't know what they don't know. These mm -hmm. unknowns around mm -hmm. ethics and responsibility. So what you and I had talked about is like our job is to make them care. Like even if you're just running your first pilot project to help optimize digital ad spend or like figure out how to send emails more efficiently, that now is when you actually want to be thinking about how your organization is going to use AI in a responsible way. And so I think a good place to start is how do you define responsible AI? Because I see AI for good, responsible AI, ethical AI. We see different terms. What do you think of when you think of responsible AI? I think the core of responsible AI is really about mitigating harm and uh, maximizing benefit. Um, and people may have seen terms like AI bias as like a, a synonym used for responsible AI. I, that's sort of one example of a harm that you could identify with AI technologies. The AI could perpetuate discrimination, but there are many other types of harm that an AI system can potentially perpetuate. Maybe it's infringing on your privacy. Uh, maybe it's um, uh, miscategorizing your identity, something something like that. Yeah. Um, so when thinking about like how to actually build responsible AI, you first have to be very clear eyed about what are you using AI for? What goal are you trying to achieve? And what are the ways that it could go wrong? Um, how could it end up 
putting people down. And then you sort of had to think, okay, then what types of ways can I redesign the system? What guardrails can I put in place to make sure that it doesn't do that? And then, and then the next step is, okay, now that we're, we've, we've eliminated or at least minimized the amount of harm that it can do, how do we maximize the amount of benefit a system can bring? Um, so if, just to make this a little bit more concrete, if we're talking about something like um, an AI healthcare system, like there are a lot of tools um, now that where AI is really good at detecting a cancer lesion in a particular uh, scan, medical scan. And one way that it could potentially harm these patients is through privacy infringement. What if for some reason, in order to train this AI model, you have to uh, amass a lot of patient medical records um, and what if a hacker then hacks that system and gets all this private patient information? So that's one harm you have to think about and, and minimize. Um, and then another harm is what if this AI system um, is discriminatory because for some reason you were only able to get um, scans from white patients, but you weren't able to get scans from black patients and then it only performs well on white patients, then it's going to end up um, exacerbating the existing health disparities in our healthcare system. So that's another thing that you have to think about. Um, and the ways that you go about mitigating them can be various solutions. Like you can, sometimes it, it has nothing to do with like the AI system itself. Sometimes it's about like cybersecurity, making sure that you have good data infrastructure to protect and prevent hackers from accessing the data. Um, sometimes it is about redesigning the algorithm, making sure that you, you rebalance um, the data that you have so that it's not discriminatory. Um, and then once we think about maximizing the benefit for this system, it's like, okay, now let's make sure that the doctors are using the system correctly. That's the best way that we'll get benefit out of this system. So then that involves educational programs, training the doctors, training the nurses, uh, communicating to patients so that they understand and feel empowered by the fact that an AI system is evaluating them and giving them a diagnosis. Um, Responsible AI sort of encompasses like the entire pipeline of development and deployment of AI technologies. Yeah, and I think from a marketing standpoint, and, and you and I have touched on this before, it's this idea of even if you're not building it, you're going to be buying all these tools that someone else built based on some data set because mm -hmm. for AI to do what it does, it needs data. And so there is this motivation as a marketer, as a brand to capture as much data as possible. I, I won't use a name, but a major telecom carrier just got hacked and they were for whatever reason, still collecting social security numbers tied to their customer accounts. And it was like mm -hmm. 40 some million records, I think. And now all of a sudden, all this personal data that the marketers were using in this organization is out in the, the world. And it has yeah. cell phone numbers, social security numbers, and who knows what other data. And that's probably just the proprietary data, the first party data they were capturing. Then they were probably buying third party data to further enrich that data. So mm -hmm. when, as a marketer to understand like, okay, AI doesn't happen without data. So at its very basic sense to do responsible AI in marketing and in business, you need to understand where the data is coming from and how the AI learns. And yeah. so if you're going and buying an ad tool or a content tool or whatever it is, you need to have the people in the room who know to ask those kinds of questions and understand what the vendor tells you about where they're getting the data from. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important aspect of responsible AI is like, who is the data coming from? Have we actually looked at it to see if it makes sense? Um, did, did the person who this data came from consent? Do they know how the data is being used? How are we storing the data and securing the data? Like all of those things are, are critical to responsible AI. So we talked a little bit about how, how it can harm people. So it can affect employees, it can affect consumers, your customers, your investors, your stakeholders. So if you make a mistake with this stuff, you can be liable. And, and you know, a lot of times the precedent hasn't been set legally yet but you could potentially be opening yourself up. The cyber security example you gave, everybody is potentially a candidate to have cyber security risks. Like it's yeah. only a matter of time probably to the organ. So think about the data you have and is that data responsible? Like, or are you not thinking about the end harm it could do? So, I mean, for a lot of organizations, we look to these big tech companies 
as an example. So like, I know Google has an ethics AI standard. I'm sure Facebook has it. Amazon probably has it. I know Adobe has it. So everybody at least has these like standards of ethics. Mm -hmm. So you cover these big companies. What, what are they trying to do? So Google obviously has massive amounts of data. Facebook has massive amounts of data. All marketers use those two tools, those two companies, to either target ads, to do the tech we do, to, to run the campaigns we run. What have they tried to do to approach AI from a responsible standpoint? We'll get into whether it's working or not in a moment, but <laughs> what are they trying to do? Yeah, okay, so let's start with Google. So Google is an interesting, uh, interesting case study. If you just think about like what Google's mission is, they're trying to, I, I forget what exactly what the tagline is, but like organize the world's information and, and essentially help retrieve relevant information for users, right? So when you're using search, when you're using Gmail, uh, when you're using their advertising tool, all of it is about trying to deliver the most relevant information to you um, in an efficient way. And so AI is actually really uh, a sort of a shoe in for that mission in that AI is very, very good at processing massive amounts of information and selecting bits of it um, based on different signals of what might be considered relevant to the user. Um, so from just like from a baseline fundamental level, it, it doesn't necessarily appear um, about at all that Google is using AI. Like it makes sense, um, it aligns with their mission um, and it, it ideally makes the product a lot better and, and helps users. Um, where does this system have, uh, like where could this system go wrong? Um, so if you think about information retrieval and the fact that all of what we know, basically <laughs> our knowledge is filtered through Google, you would then start to be concerned about what if Google is not actually retrieving accurate information for you? Or what if Google is only retrieving a specific subset of information that's not giving you a whole picture about a particular topic that leads you to have very skewed, um, a very skewed understanding or very skewed perceptions of something? Um, well, that's when you start worrying about that how AI might be involved in that. If you don't design your AI systems well, that can absolutely happen. There have been known cases where Google search will retrieve misinformation for people because if you type in, is climate change fake, you will get results that sort of reinforce your biases versus when you type in, is climate change real? Um, there have been examples of uh, the fact that Google's search al algorithm will associate negative terms with um, searches about black women. Like back in the day, if you search black women, it would mostly show porn. Whereas if you search white women, it might show fashion. And those were associations that the AI was making and it was then retrieving information in these very, very discriminatory ways. Um, and so what Google uh, essentially was trying to do when they started building their, what they called their ethical AI team. Their ethical AI team was tasked with, with thinking about what are the different ways our technologies can go wrong. We're constantly uh, trying to advance the way that AI helps us retrieve information. Um, and they set up a world-class research team to just think about these problems and conduct studies on these problems. Um, and you know, the, the, the team had a very broad um, agenda. Like they weren't necessarily told you have to do like this specific study or focus on this specific product. It was literally like any AI technology that we ever deploy, you are allowed to then scrutinize it and then tell us where things might be going wrong and whether we need to change them. Um, and I guess the punchline is that <laughs> this team started doing that in the moment that they started uh, criticizing certain very, very profitable uh, aspects of Google's technology, the leaders of the team were fired. Yeah, and so you're referring to Dr. Timnit Gabru, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And, and the interesting thing for marketers is it was related to language models. Mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, Karen. So yeah. her team with uh, Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, is that the other? Mm -hmm. So the two leads of the ethical AI team had identified potential concerns related to these large language models, which Karen has written about extensively. But when we talked about, in, in my opening talk, I talked about GPT-3 and the ability for machines to start generating language at scale. 
Well, Google has made some insane advancements in that space, but to do it, they take in lots of information, they process tons of data, they consume massive amounts of compute power. So there are ramifications to you being able to finish a sentence with Smart Compose and eventually mm -hmm. finish entire paragraphs in Google Docs and maybe eventually write the first draft of what you're writing. Mm -hmm. So this all sounds amazing as a marketer, but the reality is to Karen's point, there are ramifications to this. And so Dr. Cabru's team brought those to light and what happened, Karen? Now you kind of hit the punchline, but <laughs> there were some other things that led into it. But in essence, that led to like, well, maybe they're, they're not really behind the ethical AI they claim to be behind. Yeah, so language models, I, I guess to give more context, the way that Google uses like Google uses language models extensively. It's it shows up in Smart Compose as, as you mentioned. It's also it underpins search. Um, so the reason why you can enter a couple keywords and then get some very relevant information is because these language models are processing all of the web pages online, processing your search uh, your keyword searches, and then matching essentially what are the web pages that they should be ranking up higher that are relevant to your query. Um, and originally, like Google search hasn't always used language models, but what they realized was in using the latest iteration of language model technology, they were able to increase the relevancy of their search significantly across a broad swath of search results, which means um, that advertising revenue increases because then ads can be more um, specifically targeted to users. And what happened was um, to meet Dr. K to meet Gebru and Dr. Margaret Mitchell, they were they were looking at, at this technology, which is honestly relatively nascent. And they they started looking at like the research um, in the field. And essentially they didn't even do new research. They kind of just summarized the existing research saying, this is a nascent technology. Here are some of the risks of this technology. Um, we really should be thinking about this before we roll it out to affect billions of users around the world and the information retrieval process on the search engine. Um, and one of the things that they mentioned was um, these models have to be trained on so much text data that we can't, it is not even humanly possible anymore to understand what is in that text data. So they were capturing things like really abusive language, profanity, really racist and sexist language, which then has downstream effects. But what are those downstream effects? We don't really know. We, we just know that somewhere in these vast billions and billions of sentences that we've used to train these models, all of this garbage is being folded in. And at some point it could hurt a user by either a returning really racist search results or when you're using Smart Compose telling you to complete a sentence with um, really abusive language. And so they, what's interesting is they literally just said, we should think about this. Like they, they didn't really say anything else. They didn't say we should pull the product. They didn't say um, that like Google needs to shut down large parts of their business. Um, but that was enough for Google to suddenly be up in arms because search is a huge cash cow. Language models are powering many other things that are cash cows for Google. Um, and one thing led to another. Um, the, the paper that they were trying to release to just notify the public that, and the field that this is something that people should be studying more closely um, ended up, Google tried to censor it. Um, and then as, as things escalated, um, both of the co-leads, Dr. Gebru and Dr. Mitchell got fired and the team has sort of disintegrated from there. And this was winter 2020, if I'm not mistaken, into, into yeah. January, February, 2021. So this is recent. Yeah. And this is very recent. And again, this isn't, this isn't meant to be trashing on Google. This is, it, it's hard. Like what's happening is these advancements, as you're saying, are nascent. Like most of the, the abilities in language and vision, and Cade Metz is gonna talk about this in, in his closing keynote as well. They all basically stem from 2012 and the realization that deep learning was actually possible. 
yeah. became this race for language generation and understanding and vision and all these things that Google goes and buys DeepMinds and they buy Jeff Hinton's company and you know all this stuff just happened in the last nine years. And yeah. so they're racing forward, advancing the tech and putting teams in place to ask the hard questions. But then to your point, sometimes those hard questions, it's just maybe better that you don't ask that hard question. So they're not alone. Why don't we take a moment and talk about Facebook. So um, you had an article last year, or was it earlier this year, the disinformation? It was earlier this year, yeah. That just took off. Like I saw it everywhere in my feed, so I assume it went viral, you know, from an MIT tech review standpoint. So maybe share with everybody just the premise of the article you wrote about Facebook. And I know you've written other ones since, but what was the crux of what happened at Facebook as they were also supposedly trying to build responsible AI? Yeah, so to kind of start where we started with Google, let's let's also consider what Facebook's mission is, which is to connect everyone around the world. Um, and er, very, very early on, they started incorporating AI into everything in the platform, like anything you can possibly imagine that you can do with Facebook. It's not just advertising. The, the way that the news feed is ranked, um, at, the reason why you see certain like dog pictures first or your friends posts first, that's all AI. Um, uh, even like when you're messaging in, in messenger, like the, those like text data is also being like hoovered up to train Facebook's AI systems on Instagram. When you're like tagging people in photos on Facebook, when you're tagging people in photos, all of that is AI. Or, or not so, tagging them and they recognize who it is anyway. And they say, yeah, right, right. The photo. it's like, so probably four years ago when that started happening and people were like, how does it know it's Karen in the photo? It yeah. was AI. Like, it's, it's yeah. literally everywhere in their product. Like everything you can possibly think of, there's there's probably not a single feature on Facebook now that doesn't have some kind of AI somewhere um, hanging out, out in the background doing some things. Um, and the reason why they started incorporating it is because they thought, well, if we can increase the amount of engagement um, on the platform, then people will spend more time on the platform. They'll connect with more people. They'll see more groups. They'll, they'll like more pages and, and we'll successfully connect even more people, um, around the world. I guess that was the, the philosophy. Um, and we sort of know a little bit of what started happening. So at the time in 2016, when, um, the Trump administration came into office, there, the, the tech lash kind of started where people started questioning, wait a minute, did we somehow enable, like did Facebook somehow enable um, this new administration to come into power? Uh, like what, what role did we play sort of in um, helping elect this person? There were a lot of questions around that. Um, and people started wondering, wait a minute, like when we see, content from our friends and family on Facebook, it seems like everyone is sort of in their own filter bubble and everyone is sort of seeing different information. And some people are seeing misinformation and some people are seeing um, hate speech and, and other like really abusive content. And so like, is that, what is what, what effect is that having on our society? Um, like as, as people sort of started thinking about these things, it went back to, okay, Facebook has been using this AI to sort of maximize engagement on the platform, but it seems like we have run into this issue where just as the AI maximizes engagement, it also ends up amplifying divisive content because that's how you maximize engagement. So there were a lot of researchers um, externally that started calling for Facebook to think more deeply about this issue. Um, and Facebook decided um, in 2018 okay, we're gonna start a responsible AI team and start, uh, um, and also an integrity team, which is their name for um, trying to reduce badness on the platform. And they started doing some research into, are we actually amplifying this information? Are we actually polarizing our users with these AI algorithms that we're using? Um, and the short answer is yes. <laughs> they did these studies and they determined that this was indeed happening. But the issue was they didn't actually empower the responsible AI team to then do anything about it. Instead, they thought, well, 
if we got rid of these these polarizing polarize the in order to get rid of these polarizing effects we're going to have to get people to share less divisive content and once people start sharing less divisive content the platform's just not going to be as engaging anymore so Instead, they asked the responsible AI team to pivot to focusing on things that did not gouge their bottom line. They asked them to focus on things like fairness, um, like are we uh, are when we deploy content moderation algorithms, does it um, does it equally impact conservative users as it impacts liberal users, um, or like when we deploy. Our, our photo tagging algorithm, does it equally recognize white faces as it does black faces? Um, which is all, it, those are also important questions, but it just totally ignored this like huge fundamental problem that was kind of lurking underneath that they'd already confirmed and verified themselves internally. Um, and it's sort of very, very similar thing to the Google situation. Um, the, the few employees that were like really actively trying to ask these tough questions and were revealing ugly answers were not successfully getting leadership to actually do anything about it. And eventually they were either um, pushed out of the company or left um, voluntarily. So the, the article, and I mean, it's one of the best like headlines and um, teasers I've seen. So the article is how Facebook got addicted to spreading misinformation. And then the teaser in the article is the company's AI algorithms gave it an insatiable habit for lies and hate speech. Now the man who built them can't fix the problem. It was an awesome read. And then I know you and I both read An Ugly Truth, which is a book that recently came out from a couple of uh, writers from the New York Times where they go very, very deep into this topic. And so if that's, again, if Facebook is so critical to what we do as marketers, there's a very good chance that everyone on this session spends money on Facebook in some way to target users, whether it's through lookalike ads or through you know, their demographic and geographic, target, whatever it is, you're likely using AI to market your company and you're most definitely probably using it in your personal life as well. Maybe your kids use it and it's like, it is critical that we understand how this technology works so you understand the impact it has. So I want to kind of like step back and say like, so what can we learn from this? So as marketers, as business leaders, um, what can we take away? Like what to you is the one big take when we look at Google and Facebook, and again, not to pick on Google and Facebook, they're very high profile case of this. They are not alone. <laughs> like the yeah, other yeah. big tech companies have problems. Um, you know, we, I, I think Apple and Microsoft probably execute what they try and do a little better. Like they have their own flaws, but they seem like maybe they're more intentional about the application of AI in an ethical way. Um, but again, it's, it's kind of universal. We could, we could debate that probably. So <laughs> what though to you is I'm a business leader, I'm a marketer, and I'm trying to figure out what do I take away from, from this session? What is like that one thing that matters to me? What do you think that people can learn from these missteps when they start to figure out responsible AI within their organization? Yeah, well, I think from both these examples, you kind of see that originally, these companies started with very reasonable objectives for incorporating AI into their products. Um, and in the, initially there was no possible way to really conceive of how badly it could go wrong. Um, and so I think for marketers and business leaders now today, thinking about incorporating AI into their products um, for the first time, you should be thinking ahead into like, what, what are some of the harms? What, what am I trying to achieve? Um, how would AI help enhance that? And also what are some of the ways that this could go wrong? But then continue revisiting that question as your project evolves and as, as you incorporate AI more and more into, this, into whatever you're doing. Um, I think what happened with Facebook and Google is they, they were so early on in the AI revolution that um, there hadn't yet been a muscle really developed at the time to think about responsible AI at all. So in a way, people that are starting now have a little bit of advantage in that they've already seen ways that things can go wrong and they are primed to start thinking about this early. But you do need to continue revisiting this every time. And you, it's not just about thinking uh, 
just thinking about these things, you also need to incorporate this into your key performance indicators. You need to incorporate it into um, you know, the, the expectations of your employees. And when employees um, think about AI ethics, like they should be rewarded, they should be praised, they should be promoted. When they're asking tough questions that might have ugly answers, you should be happy about that. You shouldn't think, well, I'm gonna ignore that now moving forward and continue barreling forward with this AI project. You should think about how can we modify the project or do we need to actually pull the plug? on this project, um, even if it might in the short term have an impact on our bottom line. In the long term, it'll um, it'll probably be a good thing because you won't end up in a PR scandal, you won't end up having brand damage and people, consumers and uh, stakeholders will trust you more. Um, so I think like all of those things kind of are, are things that people should start thinking about. Um, just like establishing processes to think about these things and that have real teeth in them. And, you know, the thing I've heard you say other times is this idea of people over profits. Like as, as simple as it sounds, having that North Star of, and I think these are your words, like must benefit humans. Like whatever we're going to yeah. do has to benefit the humans that matter, the people yeah. over profits. Now that's where it becomes hard. Like if you're working at a VC funded startup and they just got 20 million in funding to race forward with AI tech and you're sitting in this thinking, well, I could identify five ways we might be kind of walking a gray line right now with this. What do you do? Like, I mean, do, yeah. do you have the voice to, so it's hard to step forward to do what Dr. Gabru and Dr. Mitchell did um, to know that you might be putting your career on the line, but like that's what it's going to take is this movement toward requiring responsible AI from consumers, from investors, from business leaders. So yeah, I just, I'm so happy we got to do this session and that all the research you're doing is helping advance this conversation because it's so important to what we're doing as an industry. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me talk about it, Paul. All right. So we've got a few minutes left and I want to have a little fun and end with some rapid fire questions. So you ready? I'm ready. All right. Uh, do you use any AI tools in your research and writing? I do. I use Google search. <laughs> um, and actually I also use the Twitter algorithm, which ranks all of the people I follow in their tweets in my newsfeed. And I, kind of rely on it to surface relevant tweets to me within yeah. the AI conversation. I love both of those because in, in my talk, I, I talk about how AI is just seamlessly integrated into your life and you start to like take things for granted. And that's where the marketing industry is going. It's going to be like Facebook where everything you touch within a CRM platform has AI and in some way we're not there as an industry right now. But Google search absolutely is an example of AI and Twitter's algorithm and YouTube's algorithm and Facebook's that like all of those don't exist without AI. So that's, yeah. that's cool. All right. Um, how do you demystify AI when you're explaining it to non-technical people? I try to just tell them that it's fancy statistics or like fancy math. Like you, you just have a giant pile of data and you need to figure out what are the relationships in this data. So you have some fancy mathematical machine that will comb through the data, find the patterns and then use those patterns to make decisions in the future. <laughs> I like it, we borrow it sometimes. Uh, okay, favorite example of AI in your daily life that most consumers take for granted or don't even realize is made possible by AI? My Netflix recommendation algorithm. <laughs> is there a show that you got recommended by that algorithm that you wouldn't have otherwise watched? That you were like, that worked. Oh man. Mine are space ones. I get like recommended for documentaries in space. And so I find all these cool things that I, again, unless I went and searched for that specific topic, but AI uh, documentaries in space are the ones that just keep surfacing in my recommendations and they keep sucking me in. Yeah, that's such a good question. I So I, re, I, I was about to say the last movie that I watched, but then I realized it was my Amazon Prime recommendation algorithm. That came Same out. thing though. <laughs> uh, but it was it was this um, Academy Award. I watch a lot of like award-winning movies. So I think I end up getting recommended more and more award-winning movies. Yeah. Um, and I watched One Night in Miami, I think it was called. Yeah. Yeah, I seen um, and it was about uh, this, it, it's like a, um, what is it? 
not a biopic, um, historical drama. I don't know. It's it's based on a true story with Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, um, and two other men that I can't remember the name of right now who just happened to intersect in one night in Miami. And it's like, it, yeah, it was like a cool um, fictional representation of, of a historical moment. So Amazon Prime and Netflix both are getting with <laughs> Disney Plus, all of them. Every, all. every media platform is doing it. Yeah. Uh, okay, what worries you most about AI and how it could go wrong? Um, just the fact that I think a lot of the public these days, um, I think are still stuck in this space where they believe they don't really have agency to shape the future of AI. And I'm, I'm sort of worried that AI, which first of all, I don't think is true. I think everyone has agency to participate in the future of how this technology is going to be developed. And, and I think attending this conference is like one way that you can start doing that. Um, and I, I just worry that if people don't participate in co-creating this technology, then we will end up with a technology that really doesn't benefit us. Like, how is it going to benefit us when there's only a small, tiny fraction of humanity that's deciding what gets to, uh, what values get to be embedded in these systems and what they um, are optimized to do. Um, yeah, so I just hope that more people can actually jump in to work on the technology. So you, you spend a lot of time obviously researching the potential downsides or the, the existing downsides, but you also get to see, as we said earlier, this front row seat to the innovations and, and maybe like what comes next and what good can you do. So what excites you most about AI? I think there's so much potential for AI to make a really big difference in things like healthcare, education, um, in like scientific discovery. Uh, that's one of the most exciting fields, like um, drug discovery, material discovery, astrophysics, try, yep. just understanding like the universe um, and really big computationally intensive problems like trying climate modeling and using climate modeling to help mitigate some of the impacts of climate change. Um, like all of those things are, are very exciting applications of AI. And I just hope that more people work on them um, because not all of them are very profitable. <laughs> Yeah, there was a, you know, a cool example was um, Demis Asabas team with DeepMind and the AlphaFold project where they can predict the folding of proteins, which again, I'm, I, I don't pretend to know exactly how all of that works, but what I know is it opens the door for the development of new pharmaceuticals, yeah. major advancements in life sciences, because they open sourced everything. And so again, yeah. we go back to like, yes, Google has missteps, but Google bought DeepMind and the resources of Google is what is enabling Demis's team to make these leaps forward that can affect climate change and health and all these other things. So it's like, there is always gonna be a good and a bad with all of yeah. this stuff. And um, so now that, that's great. Well, I, we're kind of coming up on time. So I'm just gonna ask one final, like what would you wanna leave our audience with? So having spent so much time researching this stuff, writing about this stuff, thinking about it, what is the thing you would kind of want to leave to these technologists, marketers, business leaders as they go forward and think about responsible AI? Just that AI isn't scary um, and it's not complicated. I think there's this, always this perception that, oh, it's too technical, I'm not gonna understand it. I guarantee you just spend a little bit time of time, you'll realize that AI is very simple. Um, and I hope that you'll feel empowered to do that because we need more people thinking and um, and uh, thinking about AI and thinking about its future and thinking about how to make sure it helps people. So yeah, it's not scary. It's not complicated. Just jump in. You can go back and watch her What is AI talk from year one to learn the basics and realize it's not that abstract. So Karen, I, I'm just so grateful for you to be here. Um, I love your writing. I can't wait to continue reading the research you do, especially with the new uh, fellowship. It's going to be amazing. So thank you for everything you're doing and for being a part of this event and a part of our community. Thank you so much, Paul. All right. Well, that's all for this session. I appreciate everybody being here and look forward to chatting with you after the fact. Thanks again.